progress with the Nakia Creek fire. Um, it, it, it hardly grew yesterday um, over the course of 24 hours. Um, the acreage is now up to 1,869 acres. Containment is still at 12%, although we're hoping to make some really good progress on that today. Um, really at this point, we're continuing to just do that good work on the containment lines. The goal is to um, complete those lines as quickly as possible to really keep this fire at as small a size as we possibly can. Um, and then really just focus on that mop up effort. Um, we're working with law enforcement and emergency management here just evaluating those evacuation levels um, and as soon as we can drop those that's going to be a priority to get people back into their homes um, as well as their businesses so, so, many, yeah. uh, so odf has been in charge of this fire for about 48 hours mm -hmm. since you guys took over what has changed with organization and getting um, firefighters up on the lines to build those containment lines yeah, so, um, you know, really what the team did was just bring in a lot more resources um, and we were able to just build on that work that has been um, being completed by the local agencies. Um, we just bring in uh, a lot of extra equipment, firefighters, aircraft, things like that to really just bolster those efforts that were already being done here on the line. The aircraft are they up in the air today? Is it not favorable for that? You know, uh, as you can see, uh, the fog's burning off a lot faster today, and so we have been able to get some aircraft up. That's going to be a really huge part of firefighting today, being able to use those resources, especially in some really hard to get to steep areas. So, what kind of aircraft are you guys focusing or are we able to use? I saw helicopters the other day, but someone said um, you know, they saw a uh, plane with fire retardant. Talk to me about the aircraft you guys are using. Yeah, we have a, a seven helicopters that are assigned to this fire, four Type 1s and three Type 2s. We also have two uh, water scooper planes, um, as well as an air attack platform. And so um, air attack, really, they act like the, the dispatch of the skies, if you will. They just make sure that we're, we're bringing people in, keeping them safe and, and not having multiple drops at once. And just keeping an eye on what's going on and connecting with the ground as far as communication goes. Um, so, you know, it's a huge asset to be able to use aircraft today. We haven't been able to um, for the past couple of days just due to the smoke and the fog. Um, it's going to be a game changer for us today. Looking yeah. ahead at, uh, sorry. Go ahead, no, no. Looking ahead at uh, weather for the future. Is it looking good? Uh, winds picking up at all? that would make it jump like it did last weekend? Yeah, um, we are expecting winds to pick up a little bit today, but mostly tomorrow. Um, and that is in our 48 to 72 hour plan as far as factors that we're looking at when we're creating our operational plans. Um, it isn't expected to be anything like we saw on Sunday when we were seeing those giant runs. However, it is something that we're taking into consideration. We would rather be safe than sorry. And uh, we're, we're making plans as far as that goes with our firefighting efforts. And those are? Uh, really just being aware of that potential for increased uh, fire behavior um, and then and jumping on that as soon as we see things start to take off in an area that you know we're, we're not comfortable with or, or we don't have resources on. What it really comes down to is just being aware of that that fire behavior and what that looks like, and then getting the appropriate resources to it. And I know we're supposed to get a lot of rain this weekend. Talk to me about how that helps, but also the double-edged sword of having a lot of rain come through while there's a lot of firefighters working with the fire lines. Yeah, we are expected to have uh, some pretty significant rain starting on Friday afternoon. It, it really is a catch-22 for us. While it does help actually put out the fire, it does create some hazardous conditions when it comes to the potential for mudslides. A lot of these roads are paved or even gravel, and so when you add that much rain to it and the soil that's being already turned over for the containment lines, um, it can create some additional hazards for our firefighters. So we're going to be aware of that and, and making sure everyone on the line is aware of that as well and taking the proper precautions to stay safe. And how many firefighters do you guys now have on this fire? That's a very good question. I believe we're around 500 uh, incident personnel at this point. Um, and that really is sufficient for where we're at right now. Um, if we need additional resources, we'll certainly call them in. Uh, ODF, um, PNR, where they from? Yeah, but different places. Um, there are a lot of these resources are contract resources from around the area, um, as well as Washington. Uh, we're working obviously with the Washington DNR as well and have a lot of their folks out here. Um, they have that local knowledge, which really helps us be successful. With the rain potentially creating some hazardous conditions for the ground crews, do you anticipate you maybe having to pull back some of the resources and when, once that rain starts to keep them safe? 
not necessarily for the safety components. We, we are looking at resources and what we're going to need coming up. Um, we're not going to need nearly as many firefighters out on the line just due to uh, the rain that's going to help us with those efforts. However, we want to make sure that we have the right amount of resources where we're not uh, trying to play catch up after the fact. So it's really just finding that sweet spot. Natalie, the number, I think I remember yesterday, of families um, that are in the evac evacuations of 2,400, does that sound right? I can't speak to evacuations, however, we do have the Sheriff's Office okay. here and they'll be able to answer those questions. Okay. Any other fire-related questions? Okay. All right, thank you guys so much. We'll bring up uh, Sergeant Skidmore. Thank you. So my name is Chris, C-H-R-A-S, Skidmore, S-K-I-D-M-O-R-E, and I'm a sergeant and the PIO for the Clark County Sheriff's Office. Uh, so there's some updates on our end for as far as evacuations go today for the evacuation zones. Uh, some changes are coming out right now to the ArcGIS website. They'll be coming out over the Crescent911.org, the blog, the official source to put that information out. Uh, so it'll significantly lessen the areas affected by the level three evacuation. Um, so they'll be able to get people, especially off like Livingston Mountain and some of the areas of Lassard, um, back into their homes. And then they're going to change from levels one, two, and three to just go into levels two and three evacuation zones. And so as soon as those GIS mapping is complete, those will be posted on the Cressa911.org and we'll send those out through Cressa social media and the Sheriff's Office social media sites as well. Do you feel comfortable lowering those evacuation zones even ahead of maybe some winds coming tomorrow? Yeah, and again, the way that those evacuation zones have worked the, the entire week or since we've been on this is we work in conjunction with the incident management team and based on the intel that they're giving us, they have a conversation about what they're comfortable with and when they're comfortable with the certain areas, that's where we've made the changes to the evacuations. And is the sheriff's office still doing patrols around uh, the level three areas? Absolutely, we still have people, we've had people overnight, we have dedicated deputies to each of those. We're still manning certain, um, certain road closure areas coming in and out of there. Uh, today we've seen an increased activity just into the DNR spaces and so we've contacted several people and reminded them that the DNR has closed uh, that area to recreational activities um, and then they did end up making an arrest last night of someone who was kind of going, trying to go into one of the areas that didn't really have business up there. He ended up having a warrant completely unrelated to that which is why he was arrested but that's uh, been some activity we've had. As far as the release of the car and the information of four people of anything new yeah so so actually uh, after i speak uh, curtis evanson the fire marshal who's doing the investigation will speak and you guys can ask him questions related to and he'll share any of the, the investigations for the responsible parties there so they're in charge of that investigation not, not correct yeah order. and we'll work to help them in conjunction but usually any type of fire reckless burning arson stuff is initiated through the fire marshal's investigators so. any messages you'd like to send to people still waiting to go home at this point yeah, uh, just really to, to focus on check-in. Once they get the GIS stuff, they'll send out notifications as well of the different changes. So people should be getting notifications. Check the Clark 911 website. And once you're in an area where you've been removed from the level three, yes, people are welcome to go back home. We'll adjust our road closures and our plan as far as uh, deputies in those areas to kind of decrease that footprint and allow people back uh, into those areas. And just remind people, if you don't have a business being there, you're not part of those homes, it's still not a sightseeing fire. So please stay out of those areas and let firefighters Super critical too, as Natalie mentioned, there's like 500 personnel plus assigned. You've seen the size of this camp grow, so we really want, there's so much equipment and stuff moving, we really want to keep people out of those areas that don't need to be there. Any other questions? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Curtis Evanson. I'm the assistant fire marshal with Clark County. My name is spelled C U R T I S. Last name Evanson is spelled E A V as in Victor E N S O N. I'm the assistant fire marshal with Clark County. I'm also the lead investigator in the Nakia Creek fire. Um, I'll let you know that we've had a tremendous response from the public on information coming to us uh, from the press release that we did. Um, a 
large number of calls. We're currently triaging that information and dispatching our investigators out to follow each lead to its end. Currently, we don't have any advance in the, the investigation. Um, I would ask anybody out there that has information, no matter how trivial they think it is, please call us and uh, fill us in on it, because it may actually mean something to us, even though it seems trivial to you at the time. Go ahead and call. I'd also like to reach out to the individuals that they recognize themselves as that being their vehicle and where they are out there, to please give us a call and let's talk about what happened. Uh, let's sort this out. Uh, feel free to call us and let's talk. Any questions from you guys? Have you narrowed down what the car might be? I mean, you're saying it's maybe uh, it may be a Subaru. That's the best information we have right now. Uh, there were some individuals that um, encountered that vehicle. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, early on in the event, and while they can't nail down the the actual model of Subaru, they they were all confident it was a Subaru. So that's the best information we have at this point. Um, we've done some enhancements on the video to try to get a better idea, but we haven't really gotten a, an advance in that area yet either. So. And where'd that photo come from? We had an individual who was out there um, on a ridge above, and he saw the plume of smoke very early on. It caught his attention, so he took his cell phone and began videotaping. Um, he had to zoom how far away he was. He had to zoom to get that video that you see, so that's part of the problem with the quality of it, is how far away he was. And do you have an ex a location of where that video was taken? It was on a road above um, the 1520 road. I'm not sure exactly what the distance was away above, but it was above that 1520 road. I'm not sure if you talked about this yesterday or the day before, but you say, hey, if you're out there and you think it's you, let's talk. That indicates that you don't necessarily think that this was nefarious. Uh, hard to say at this point, but I would certainly extend that invitation to them to, hey, please call, let's talk about it, let's sort this out. Um, there's some indications to us in the video that it might have been a pyrotechnic that was used. I'm not going to go as far as to say a consumer firework, but something like that. So I can't talk to an intent. All I can see is what I have on the video, so I would extend that invitation. Please, now's the time to call and let's talk. How close um, was that car to um, the believed ignition point of the fire? It was, the vehicle was several hundred yards away. Um, I, I haven't gone out there with a rage finder yet to determine the actual distance. That's something we plan to do once we're able to get into the area. Roughly about 700 yeah. yards. Not 700, several. Several hundred. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Dave Larson, D A V E L A R S O N. I serve as Deputy Incident Commander for ODF IMT 2. I'd like to begin by uh, starting out to uh, thank the community and uh, the cooperators, uh, especially for your uh, patience and grace as uh, we come into your community uh, during a very stressful time and uh, begin to organize and uh, take action on this fire. Um, we've had great uh, cooperators uh, that have assisted us, some of them uh, like Washington Department of Transportation, uh, State Police, uh, the Sheriff's Office, and multiple others have been just really great in helping uh, support us here on this incident. You know, I want to also state that, you know, it's very important uh, for customer service for this team uh, to meet your needs uh, here in the community and really looking at those relationships. When we come in here uh, into a community, it's about the relationships. And we may come here from Oregon just across the border as strangers, but we want to meet your needs and we want to be able to leave here as your friends. Um, excellent progress has been made on this fire to date. Um, you've only seen about an additional 73 acres of growth from yesterday. A lot of that was just kind of interior uh, burning of some of the islands and some of the pieces of, of different um, parts of spot fires uh, that have joined together. But we're working really hard on those containment lines, uh, especially in that southwest corner of the fire. As you've noticed, um, some of the evacuation 
uh, levels have decreased and we look forward for those continuing on a glide path down uh, in the next in the future here there are over 500 personnel assigned to this fire and I also want to let everybody know that this fire is the number one priority in the nation so resources that we're asking for the things we need uh, we're able to get those and we are elevated as the top priority again the evacuation levels are lowering and as Natalie stated earlier, we're thinking already 72 hours out ahead of what that might mean. Um, looking out ahead, the potential for rainfall. We're looking at that and the potential of, uh, you know, could be a couple inches of rainfall on the fire incident. That's really good for the fire because Mother Nature is one of the best uh, firefighting resources that we have out there with that rainfall. However, it's going to create some obstacles for us in the future. And so we're looking at the exposure to the firefighters that are out there with the cooler temperatures. Um, the mud uh, that you'll find out here, not only out there uh, driving on the fire lines, but also right here in camp, there could be uh, conditions that, you know, with the rainfall that we'll have to put up with dealing with that. So we're looking at that and uh, taking action where need be. Um, we're getting the fire as far as our objectives and we're meeting those is getting the fire contained as quickly as we can, as small as we can, while the priority is maintaining firefighter and public safety. So a lot of times we go in on the evacuation levels, we got to go in there, we got to make sure the fire is uh, secure because that is our number one objective is that firefighter and public safety. And as we see it's safe to get in there and that the fire behavior has been mitigated and managed, we will get folks in there as soon as we can. Thank you. Can you describe the fire a little bit as far as it, is it an undergrowth or is it top, there's top in trees? You know, there's various intensities throughout the fire area in places where you've had the, the fuels uh, the, and the topography align with the wind. Uh, you'll see some uh, stand replacement fires where a lot of the canopy uh, gets up in the canopy and burns. But there's also quite a bit of the fire line area where the fire wasn't burning as intense and it was more of an understory burn. Uh, that is a little bit of double-edged sword in parts because what it does, it doesn't maybe consume all the fuel. It might pre-dry it, so there is always a potential if you get the ember, you could get some reburning going on in there. And so that's some of the focal areas that the operations is using is looking and identifying those places where we need to spend a little extra effort to prevent uh, reburn from happening. Can you tell us what makes this the, the number one priority fire? Yeah, a lot of factors go into that. We do an incident complexity analysis and we forward that through. So what we look at is uh, the potential, the values of risk. And uh, when you have, uh, at one point in time on this fire, you had over 40,000 folks under a level of, some levels of evacuation, uh, it is a high priority. So life is one. And then also looking at the, the resources as well as the potential. Like I say, we're not out of the woods yet. There's still work to be done on this fire but I'm feeling confident as we start turning the corner, uh, as we get into Friday, into Friday evening, we start seeing that rainfall, that'll be good. Today is gonna to be a little bit different of a challenge just because uh, we have the conditions um, are a little drier than they were yesterday. And uh, as you can see, the sun is already out. Um, and yesterday at this time it was foggy. So uh, again, double-edged sword, the fire is gonna be able to see, but now our aircraft will be able to see as well. The uh, homes that you run into as you're going into it, uh pretty well defendable they everybody treated their house as well uh, I have not personally been out there on the line we can research that that question there but um, I will say that no structures have been lost in this this fire at this point all right thank you very much do a quick update for you guys here do you like updates uh, so we did just uh, push out the updated evacuation maps. So those are live on both the uh, Cressa site and on the county ArcGIS site. So you could go in there and put your addresses and see if you guys are in under current either level two or level three evacuation. And those have been pushed out again. So if you need information, go to the Cressa911.org website and all the updated maps and links to that are available there. Thank you. I just got word that uh, I think a Type 1 is about to take off from here, so um, might be a good shot for you guys to get really fast. Um, and then uh, everyone who's going on the media tour, if I can grab you guys over here. How long do you think that's going to take? Uh, just wondering. Probably two hours tops. Two hours. Okay. I was just wondering. Uh, I need to get out. Yeah, so we, we can. We have 